Welcome everyone for our Bible study for Wednesday evening, May the 19th. We are glad that you are here uh, today. We begin uh, about a five week, I think it's five weeks, where we're going to look at the first five chapters of Acts or however far we get in the book of Acts. I will continue to record with Katie Scholl's help this Bible study, uh, which is being has been consistently recorded on Wednesday mornings, late Wednesday morning, and shown uh, at night at six o'clock. It, it actually has gone online before then. And uh, but also during these five weeks, for those of you who would like to come to an in-person Bible study on the same passages, same topic. At six o'clock in the fellowship hall, uh, we will do that as well. Uh, same study, obviously there'll be time for conversation in the in-person uh, study, but uh, same material covered. So I hope that you will, uh, for both, either one, we hope that you will be a part of that. Again, we'll do that for the next five Wednesday nights. Uh, before we dive into Acts chapter 1 today, hear this uh, prayer concern list. Uh, D. Harbor had successful surgery yesterday, and we are grateful she remains in the hospital. Uh, we want to pr continue to pray for Carolyn Campbell in the death of her father, David Doherty, and his service will be Thursday tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I believe it's at uh, Klingel Carpenter. Uh, Audrea Chapel's dad uh, passed away, and so we want to remember Audrea, a part of our church, also uh, prepares the meals for our fab care children. Uh, we pray for her and her family. And then several folks who have either been in the hospital recently or over some time that we want to be continuing to pray for. Uh, Jane Fotis was, and Martha Hagen and Janine Price were in the hospital last week and now uh, discharged, doing well. And we want to continue to remember Jeff Hood. Um, there are many others for us to pray for. Uh, certainly we want to continue to pray for this uh, gradual move back towards whatever the new normal is going to be. And there will be an announcement tomorrow in the columns about our uh, policies for masks on Sunday morning. Uh, we want to pray for those places of the world where COVID continues to uh, be a ma create major pain, thinking specifically of India. Uh, and we want to be praying for uh, Israel and uh, the conflicts between uh, Palestinians and Israel um, and that uh, sacred place, obviously to us, uh, but also to as followers of Jesus, but also to other peoples as well, praying for God's uh, kingdom to come and will to be done in that area, uh, even as we pray for peace everywhere. So let's pray together. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for Dee's successful surgery. We pray that you would bless and keep her as she recovers. We pray for Carolyn and her family as they mourn the death of her dad and for Audrey and her family as they mourn her dad's death. We continue to pray for Jeff and Jane and Martha and Janine and many others. Hold them in your care. Lord, we pray for peace in Israel. We pray for uh, the ability of Palestinians and Israelis to sit at the negotiating table, to sit at the table of fellowship, and to work through differences and to seek uh, common good. Uh, we pray your kingdom to come and your will to be done in Israel as it is in heaven. We pray for India and other nations that continue to, to battle COVID in very uh, uh, difficult ways. We pray for your healing, for your strength. We pray for those uh, on the front lines, those making decisions, give wisdom, give protection, give healing. We pray for our own congregation and our own community and throughout the United States. Uh, we're grateful that that we seem to be nearing the end or seeing that light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic. We pray that you would still give us wisdom and caution but also be with us as we move toward uh, more normal activities. Oh Lord, we pray that you would uh, open our hearts and minds and speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't do one more thing before we started the study and say, go herd. Uh, national champions in men's soccer. What an amazing game. If you, uh, if you stayed up to watch it, it was absolutely phenomenal, stunning, fun. Uh, I'm still 
still excited from watching that game. So we're, we're, we're excited in our community. I have a feeling we'll talk about that on Sunday just a bit. Okay, so Acts chapter 1, that's what we'll cover today. We're following um, the, the liturgical calendar. So Acts chapter 1, the first part of it, uh, talks about the ascension of Jesus. And from the chronology that Luke gives us here in Acts chapter 1, we, um, we get the chronology of Jesus' uh, resurrection appearances, that he appeared to his disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended to be with uh, the Father in heaven, which means that last Thursday was the 40th day since uh, our Easter celebration, which means that, would, that was Ascension Day. And then 10 days after Jesus ascended to be with the Father, 50 days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And so this coming Sunday is 50 days after our Easter celebration. It's amazing how time flies. Um, and, and so this Sunday is the day of Pentecost for us. We celebrate, we remember, and we uh, reflect on the scripture passages that speak to the Holy Spirit as we uh, celebrate the day of Pentecost. Uh, now, Acts chapter 1 covers the ascension and then the next 10 days until Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 covers Pentecost. We'll talk about Pentecost on Sunday. Uh, I'm not preaching from Acts chapter 2, which is the, the, the actual account of what happened at Pentecost, preaching from John's gospel uh, where Jesus talks about the Spirit. Uh, but we'll read portions of Acts chapter 2 in worship ne this Sunday, and then next week we'll, we'll get into this Bible study, we'll get into uh, Acts chapter 2. So, uh, Acts chapter 1, but I'm going to read the first sentence of Acts chapter 1, and then we're going to go back to Luke's gospel. Uh, Acts 1, chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. Now, let's turn back to Luke chapter 1, if you would. We'll look at this briefly. Luke chapter 1, the first four verses. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have, been, that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed." Luke's gospel is written uh, to a specific person whose name is Theophilus. We don't know anything about Theophilus, uh, but, but clearly this is addressed to him. Uh, but my sense would be that Luke has a larger audience in mind, doesn't think that uh, Theophilus will keep it to himself, uh, but will share this gospel that is written directly to him. Verse 1 of chapter 1 of Luke, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of all that God has done through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Luke is acknowledging that other gospels are being written. Other people are writing down, not necessarily gospels, but are writing down accounts of the life of Jesus. Uh, and then he says, just as they were handed on to us uh, by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. Uh, Luke was not an eyewitness. He becomes a follower of Jesus later through the witness of eyewitnesses. And this reminds us, again, verse 2, he's saying it just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. We talked about this last month or several weeks ago, several, maybe more than a month ago, how when, when uh, up until recently in human history, most cultures were uh, storytelling cultures. They were speaking cultures more than they were writing and reading cultures. And, and what happened was Jesus is raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And it's this amazing uh, work of God. And what the disciples, the early Christians, the apostles quite naturally would have done was to be amongst themselves. They would tell the stories of Jesus, all that Jesus did, all that he said, uh, all that he taught, all that God did through uh, Jesus. They would tell those stories to themselves. They would share them with people who did not know Jesus as a part of their witness. And they didn't need to write everything down because, again, it was an oral culture where it was 
that's just what you did. You spoke repeatedly all of the things that were important to you. And I'll tell the story again just because I love telling it. Uh, in the first 25 years of his life, Alicia's dad, my father-in-law, uh, had amazing adventures in the woods of East Tennessee and uh, with his family, with his cousins in college, all those kinds of things. He has amazing adventures for 25 years and he spends the next 50 years telling those stories of all that had happened in his life. And one of the things that I love, new to the family, uh, so I knew him the last 20 years of his life, I got to hear, we got to hear all of those stories. And, and so at 75, he was telling stories about what happened to him when he was 10 as if it happened yesterday because he had been telling those stories over and over and over and over again for decades. And then, as we shared a couple months ago, uh, toward the end of his life, Alicia, we all realized, Alicia especially, that we needed to record those stories because once uh, he died, there would be no one to tell them. And so she sat down with a video camera and, and got her dad to tell and share all these stories, and now we have them recorded. A very similar thing happened, we believe, with the early uh, followers of Jesus. So about 40 years or so after Jesus was res raised from the dead, uh, after he ascended into heaven, the original apostles, the, the early followers of Jesus begin to die as, as, they, as they age. And they, people realize, wait a second, we need to write down the stories now from all these eyewitnesses because they've been telling them to us and we've been passing them down. But as they depart, as they are no longer going to be with us, we're not going to have any eyewitnesses to check the story, to make sure the story's being told properly, accurately, faithfully. And so people started writing accounts of the life of Jesus. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, uh, it seems like Luke is probably referring to Mark uh, and maybe some others. We know that Mark was the first to write a gospel. And when he says that others are setting down orderly accounts of the life of Jesus, he probably has at least Mark and others in mind. And then he says in verse 3, I decided, still in Luke chapter 1, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So again, not an eyewitness, but Luke... Uh, takes eyewitness testimonies. He, he looks at other written sources. We believe that um, a part of what Luke writes in his gospel is based on Mark's gospel. So Luke probably had a copy of Mark in front of him as he wrote. He's doing careful historical work, careful journalistic work. He's, 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 you know, he's, 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 uh, he's asking eyewitnesses. He's also hearing the stories and he's passing them on so that Theophilus can be properly instructed in the way of Jesus. Now skip over to Acts chapter one and, and we're still talking to Theophilus. In the first book, Theophilus, same person, Luke says, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. At the end of Luke's gospel, he gives a brief description of the ascension. Now he's going to give a more detailed ascension here, but he ends his gospel with a brief description of the ascension of Jesus. And then he says, Jesus ascended after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And now verse three, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, appearing to them during 40 days. So that's where we get the ascension being 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. That's the, our, the chronology that we follow is the chronology that Luke gives us. Uh, he's giving instructions to the, to the disciples through the Holy Spirit. Uh, after his suffering, verse 3, he, um, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. In other words, more resurrection appearances than are recorded by uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were multiple uh, multiple appearances of Jesus. And he's appearing to them with convincing proofs, uh, proving to them that he is alive, that he is the risen Lord, and that all that he has done and said and that God has done through him has, is validated because he's there. He's, he's right there among them. And then one other thing that Luke tells us that Jesus does during his resurrection appearance that, that to me seems very significant. He appears to them during 40 days speaking about the kingdom of God speaking about the kingdom of God. Um, 
remember that Luke's gospel begins like Mark and Matthew with Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of heaven has come near, repent and believe the good news. In Mark and in Luke, um, Jesus uses the phrase, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Uh, they mean the same thing. Uh, and, and so we've talked about, we talk about this a lot because I think this is central to, uh, to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think this is central to the gospel that in his very person, in his very life, human, fully human, fully divine, Jesus brings the kingdom of God to earth. And through his death and resurrection, he fully est he, he establishes the kingdom of God on earth, which is still here through the Holy Spirit, will one day be fully established when Christ returns and heaven and the kingdom, heaven and earth, uh, become one. Uh, but so, so it seems to me very significant that just as he had taught the disciples about the kingdom of God during his earthly ministry, and just as he had announced that the kingdom of God is present through him in his very flesh, Jesus is teaching them, continuing to teach them about the kingdom of God in his resurrection appearances. Verse four, while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. Verse five, uh, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So as part of his resurrection appearances, as part of his teaching about the kingdom of God, as he is preparing to depart, Jesus tells them to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. His departure is connected to the coming of the Spirit. He can't depart amongst them without promising them that they're not going to be alone. And the Spirit's going to come to indwell them. We'll talk a lot about this on Sunday from John, the end of chapter 15, the first part of chapter 16 of John's gospel. Uh, one, one historic note, he talks about being baptized with water and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, one of these days we'll do a historical study of the Pentecostal movement uh, among Christianity um, in our day. Pentecostalism really got started in 1906 in California with what was called the Azusa Street Revival and people began speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit came upon them in a very powerful way and, and, and this Pentecostal movement grew. It's one of the fastest growing uh, 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 parts of the Christian family in uh, uh, South America, Africa, and, and Asia. And one of the things that people talk about from the Pentecostal movement is being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Um, and what, and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not well versed in Pentecostalism, but from what I do know, there is this sense of being baptized in the Holy Spirit in, in ways not necessarily exactly like what happened on the day of Pentecost, but in, in ways where there's, there's somehow a special coming of the Spirit upon you that... Uh, that enables you to have a powerful experience, that enables you to, to do certain things through spiritual gifts. Again, one of these days we'll talk more in depth about that. What I want to say today is being baptized with the Holy Spirit, I think, is a specific reference to what happened uh, on the day of Pentecost. And, and for us, in our day, the moment we trust Jesus and begin to follow him, uh, the Holy Spirit, I believe, comes and dwells within us. Now, we, we are baptized to give witness to this faith, and we do believe God is, is present in the midst of the baptism, but it is through faith, uh, and, 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 and baptism isn't optional. We're called to be baptized, but, but it is in that moment of faith that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And so um, I don't think what, John, uh, what Jesus is talking about here is about... Um, a special baptism of the Holy Spirit that all of us are supposed to have. He's referring specifically to what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. And since the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes into believers, not necessarily in dramatic ways like it happened on that day, but through embracing Jesus by faith. Okay, I hope I didn't confuse things uh, too much there. Again, that'll be a subject for another day. Let's move on to verse 6. So when, for, uh, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, I always want to laugh at the disciples here and to laugh at myself and to laugh at us at how hard it is for us to really grasp what Jesus uh, is up to in our lives. He's been teaching them about the kingdom. He's been describing the kingdom and he's more than likely telling them how to live faithfully to the kingdom. And all they're concerned about is, okay, when's this going to happen? Give us a timetable. 
uh, all right, Lord, we're impatient. Tell us, when are you, gonna, when are you, fully, when are you gonna fully establish the kingdom among us? And Jesus patiently replies in verse seven, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Uh, which, you know, by the way, just as an aside, uh, it, it, it's baffling to me when, when uh, preachers and others make exact predictions of the exact time when Jesus is going to return. Because when they do that, I want to say, well, what do you do with verse 7 where Jesus, it's Jesus saying this. It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. And in the Gospels, Jesus says, it's not for, me, for him, for me to know Jesus says this. I don't even know. This is, this is on the Father's authority. So I think that when we get caught up in trying to predict uh, when the, the second coming of Christ is going to happen, I think we're, I don't, I don't think that's biblical. I think we're drifting in, in areas that we need to, we need to be very careful uh, as, as we drift into those areas. Okay, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, very important that we understand our witness to happen through the power that we have received from the Holy Spirit, not through our own power, our own wisdom, our own uh, goodness. Uh, no, we, we give witness to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit that comes and dwells within us. And again, Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. You need to be prepared. Uh, you need to be ready for the Spirit to come. And then when this happens, you will be my witnesses. Now, uh, particularly through the end of, at the end of Matthew's gospel, we, we get this rhythm here as well in Luke's gospel of Jerusalem, Judea, Judea and uh, Samaria, and all the world. So there are these different concentric circles that we go out to and witness our own immediate community and then just outside our community and then our region and then all the world. And so we try to be uh, participants in, uh, in, in the work of, of Jesus uh, everywhere. Uh, interestingly enough, it, it's through our denomination, the American Baptist churches, that we best participate in uh, or, or most consistently participate in the, the, the work of, of the gospel around the world. I uh, was talking with a friend, actually a classmate recently, a divinity school classmate who is now the, uh, I don't know what his title is, but he's, he's the top person, the coordinator for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, um, which is the nomina denomination that we were a part of in our churches in North Carolina. And, and he, uh, Paul is his name, and Paul was telling me that, you know, we we're talking about what are the role of denominations in, in today's rapidly changing world. And he talked about denominations giving local churches uh, a, an entree, an entry point to the global church. Uh, in other words, we've been faithful Christians, uh, not perfect, because we've, we've exported a lot of stuff that is not a part of the gospel, but, but Christians around the world have shared the gospel such that um, the vitality of our faith is, is no longer uh, centered in North America, uh, both demographically, but also energy wise, the, the energy and the, the numbers for Christianity are now in Africa and South America and in Asia. Uh, so we, we continue to participate in being witnesses around the world, but through our denomination, we have an entry point into the global church. We get connected to our sisters and brothers in Africa in India. I know West Virginia Baptists have had, we've had a connection with India over the years. We get connected to places around the world. And I think that's vital. It's vital to remember that in, in many ways, uh, the work of, of verse uh, eight has, has, has gone well, and we've shared the gospel to the ends of the earth. And now we wanna stay, continue to do that, but we wanna stay connected to our sisters and brothers who are in other parts of the world. All right, verse 9, when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, get busy. Uh, don't be focused. Yeah, he's going to come back in the same way. But don't be focused on that. You've got work to do. You've been given a commission. Now get ready to fulfill that commission. 
the specific commission right now is wait, wait until the Spirit comes, and then you will fulfill the commission of proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Verse 12, we have a shift. We move from the account of the, uh, the ascension of Jesus and his appearances as the resurrected Lord. And now we're, we're into that 10-day period in between the ascension of Christ and, and the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. Um, verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealous, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. We're going to come back to this uh, when they choose a replacement for Judas, but for now, Let's just imagine that scene. I mean, you've, you've, your, your world is turned upside down. I mean, you, you've been on this emotional, spiritual roller coaster. Your hopes have been dashed and your hearts are grieving because Jesus is crucified. And then all of a sudden you realize that he'd been telling you this all along, that on the third day he was going to rise from the dead and you experience the resurrection. And then over 40 days, you have these periodic appearances of Jesus as the risen Lord to you. And, and you know, you're, you're both, you're scared because the, the Jewish officials and the Romans are, are still not happy with you, but you're also thrilled and excited. And, and there's this, this, this energy. And then you've, you've just been told, uh, okay, wait now because the spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not just the 11, but it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and others, men and women who are there. I mean, it, it's, it's just this amazing setting. And what do they do? Constantly devoting themselves to prayer. They pray constantly through these 10 days between uh, Ascension and Pentecost. Moving on. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. It's a pretty large crowd when you think of it pretty large crowd and said, and so much larger than the 11. And, I, and, and that's something that uh, just kind of as an aside that I know I tend to forget. I think we tend to forget when we think of the, uh, when we think of the apostles, first the 12 and then the 11 after Judas's betrayal, we tend to focus solely on them. And we forget that there was a larger group of followers of Jesus, original followers of Jesus, original eyewitnesses to Jesus um, and to his resurrection and, and who had received appearances from the risen Lord, who were, who were with them. Now, they weren't apostles. They, they didn't give the specific call to be apostles that the 12 did, but they were very much a part of the church. Church, original church, very first church, was larger than just the 11. Verse 16, friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Let's, let's pause there. How painful, how painful it must have been that Judas betrayed Jesus. Not only betrayed Jesus, but betrayed them. He was numbered among us. He was their brother. They, they, they did so much together. How painful it must have been, his betrayal. Obviously, even more painful to Jesus. Verse 17, excuse me, verse 18. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out, a horrible sight. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that the field uh, was called in their language, Hakodama, that is field of blood for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead become desolate and uh, let there be no one to live in it. So the first order of business in talking about Judas is to uh, connect the Old Testament scriptures with this. This was, this was foretold. Uh, as painful as this was to us, as painful as this was to Jesus, 
uh, this was going to happen. This was a part of the narrative that was going to play out through the death of resurrection, the death of Jesus. And so this, the, this is the first thing that needs to be acknowledged with, with Judas, trying to explain how, how someone they loved could do something so horrible who could betray them. Well, this was foretold, which doesn't mean that Judas was a puppet doesn't mean that he was acting on autopilot and had no control of his actions. Instead, it means this was a such a natural part of what Judas, who was a zealot, who wanted Jesus to overthrow violently with military force, the Romans, this, this was just foretold that this was going to happen, that, uh, that someone was going to betray Jesus in this way, and, and it happens, and, and there are judgment consequences because of that. And that's what, uh, Peter describes. Okay. But then he shifts. He's talked about Judas. He, he talked about the judgment upon Judas, talked about the fact that this was going to happen. And then he shifts and he says, he quotes another old Testament passage, let another take his position of overseer. We've got to replace Judas. We still got to have the 12, 12 being the symbolic number of the 12 tribes of Israel. Twelve apostles representing uh, Jesus, embodying all that Israel was supposed to be, and now the disciples symbolically uh, doing that as well. Verse 21, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus was went in and out among us, um, uh, this, is, this is the group that they're going to choose from. It's, it's got to be someone, it won't be one of the 11, obviously, but it has to be someone within that 120 or so of people who have been there from the beginning. That's the pool of people that we're going to choose from for the apostle, for this next apostle. Beginning with the, they were here beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. Now, all of them who've received a resurrection appearance of Jesus are witnesses to the resurrection. But they're talking specifically here of entering into that uh, special symbolic group of the 12 that have been given the specific apostolic call to give witness to the resurrection um, in a way that's just a little bit different than the other way. We're all called to give witness to the resurrection, but there was something specific about the apostolic call and someone is being invited into this um, into this group to, to f make it 12 again. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barabbas, uh, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. Uh, then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which J Judas turned aside to go his, to his own place. And they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias and he was added to the 11 apostles. Um, upon a kind of a surface reading here, it would seem like um, one might say, hey, they just, they just drew lots to determine the two. <clears throat> and then you might then say, okay, when there's a difficult decision that we face, why don't we draw lots? And, and that'll be the way in which the Lord uh, gives us direction on what to do. That is not what happened. It is not the case. The drawing of the lots was at the very end of a 10 day process of spiritual discernment. Back to chapter one, verse 14, all the, those, uh, all, they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. So they had been praying for 10 days and you know, they probably took a break to eat. They probably took a break to do other things, but, but it is safe to say that most, because Jesus had told them, get ready. You're gonna be receiving power from the Holy Spirit. This was in all. This was a ten-day prayer meeting, so they are spiritually attentive. They are spiritually alert and aware, and they are listening to Jesus. Uh, they are listening to God. They're getting ready to receive the Holy Spirit. They are spiritually alert. They're spirit. They are spiritually in a good place. They've also, in that from that spiritual place, they've also already practiced discernment. They've realized God has led them. They've realized through their own wisdom as well, divine and human wisdom, God has led them to say, hey, this new apostle, it's not going to be a stranger. The person that takes Judas's pace is, is going to be someone that was with us from the very beginning, from John's baptism all the way up until when Jesus ascended to be in heaven. So, so there is some discernment going on there. And then they have conversation. 
prayerful conversation. And out of that prayerful conversation emerges two names. And it's only after they get the two names that they say, we're going to draw lots, cast lots to see which one is going to be called to be the apostle. Uh, it seems to me, to see which one the Lord has chosen, it seems to me that um, e either one of these would have been just fine. They're, they're at that place where they've, they've been praying for 10 days. They, they've, they're, they're practicing the wisdom that God has given them. Um, they, they know the pool from whom they can draw someone for this position. And they've come up with two great candidates. And now, at, and now they're like, okay, we're just going to, we're going to draw lots to see. And that will be the way the Lord tells us which of these two. So in other words, this wasn't a random, eh, we'll just draw lots and see what happens. No, this was the culmination of a long spiritual process and at the, and which brought them down to two names. And, and at the end of that, and, and they wouldn't have brought those two names if they didn't think that both of them would be good candidates. And at that point, they cast the lots, and that's the way that they discern the will of God in this matter. Um, which, as we apply that to our moments of decision, it, it seems to me that the, the key thing is that sense of deep prayer and being in a rhythm of prayer. You don't want to make decisions. You don't want to try. I, I, I'm not, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's dangerous to, to try to discern what God is calling us to do in certain situations if we haven't been in a good rhythm of prayer. 10 days of constant prayer certainly qualifies for a good rhythm of prayer. Now, for us, it would be more like we've been in a good rhythm on a day-by-day -day basis over a consistent season of praying, of studying the scriptures on a daily basis, of, of participating in worship, of being in fellowship with believers, uh, you know, and, and the, the time that each of us need in discernment varies in terms of how long we need to be, that, be in that rhythm. But, but we need to be in that rhythm when we uh, make discernments. I think I said this week before last that, uh, you know, if you're not in that rhythm, God can still give you direction. The Lord can do anything. Um, but, but, but the wise thing to do, if you know you've got a decision coming up, a, a discernment question, is to make sure you're in that rhythm of prayer and listening to God. And then you, you use your wisdom. They use their wisdom in saying, hey, this needs to be someone that was with us from the beginning. They use their wisdom in choosing two people, um, you know, and they do it together. It's not one person. It's not Peter that's making this decision. They're, they're doing this together. And then they, they arrive to the place where it's just between two people and they cast lots. Don't know that we need to do that if we ever get in a position where we've got two equally, uh, what seem to us equally good choices, whether of people or of, of courses to go. Um, but, but, you know, if, if we've done the homework, if we're in good spiritual rhythms, if we've consistently been serving the Lord, talking to the Lord, if we have, if we're in a, a, a good rhythm of obedience, we're not, we're never going to reach perfection in this life. But, but if, if, uh, there, if there are patterns of sin that we are leaving behind, uh, what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, uh, but be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will discern what is the will of God. If we are in that rhythm of, of working through the Holy Spirit, of, of not being conformed to the world and being transformed by the renewing of our minds, if we're doing that and if we're practicing that wisdom, then um, I can see arriving at a place where we might do something like casting lots. Again, I I'm not suggesting that, but, but I think what it's, what it's saying, what I'm, the main point is that happens at the very end of a long spiritual process. Um, okay, let's, I'm having a, a hard time figuring out exactly how to end this because I could talk, I, th I think to me that sense of being spiritually grounded in a consistent way is, is so crucial to just about everything that we do. And, um, and my hope is that we will grow more in our ability to walk closely with the Lord and thus to make those discerning uh, moves. Uh, not that God tells us exactly what to do, but through our listening to the, to the spirit within us, 
we, we, we have that sense of where the Lord is leading us. All right, we'll wrap that up again. We'll start on Sunday with the Pentecost day and, um, and, and then next Wednesday we'll dive into Acts chapter two. But the key to the passage is that ascension of Jesus where he's gone to be with the father. He's going to send the son. And in the, in the in-between time, uh, the, the apostles have some work to do, but that work in terms of choosing a replacement for Judas, but that work comes out of deep prayer. And so I invite us as we uh, anticipate Sunday to be in prayer for that service, for that moment for our church and for us as individuals, that we might not only remember the coming of the, the Spirit at Pentecost, but that we might, like the disciples, anticipate and pray that God may give us a, a new sense of the presence and power of the indwelling Spirit. Let's pray together. We thank you, O oh God, for the ascension of Jesus to be with, with you. We thank you, Father and Son, for the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost and into our hearts the moment we trusted Jesus. We thank you for that 10 days of waiting and praying and working that the apostles did. We pray for our service on Sunday, this day of Pentecost, in some way, shape, or form for each of us who are listening. Help us to, to pray in anticipation. And we thank you for the example of the apostles that remind us that in those moments of discernment, that being in that rhythm of prayer is so crucial, out of which we practice wisdom and out of which we come to understand your will and we hear your guidance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you Sunday, and we'll see you next week for this Bible study. God bless you.